environmental peace building. So if you're interested in the conference at large, um, you should feel free to check out the conference agenda and the links to register for other sessions as well in the chat. Um, before we start, I would like to briefly share information about ethical conduct with you. Apologies, I'm just going to share my screen. There you go. So this is a brief compliance reminder from the conference organizers <clears throat> that by registering and participating in this event, you agree to abide by the NPAC's anti-discrimination, harassment and retaliation policy. The harassment in every form is unacceptable at this conference. And although this session is being recorded, all reports will remain strictly confidential. So um, let me briefly introduce our main speakers today. We have an exciting set of papers and a really excellent cast. Um, I will start with um, Nina von Uxkul, uh, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University. She's also Director of the Uppsala Rotary Peace Center. Her main research areas are the impacts of climate change and natural hazards on armed conflict and human security. And uh, she's combining advanced statistical methods with surveys and field inf interviews and the like. Nina currently leads the project Petroleum Prices and Protests, Impact of Climate Change Mitigation and Social Unrest, funded by the Swedish Research Council and the Food Security Work Package in Mr. Geopolitics. Let me also introduce to you Nina Sofia Schlager, um, our panelist uh, from the Gratit Institute of International and Development Studies. Um, she's a PhD researcher in international relations and political science at the Gratit Institute. And her main research interests are in adaptive socio-ecological systems, household behavior, evidence-driven modeling, food security and nutrition, and humanitarian crisis response. We also have um, Halvard Buhaug, who is a um, research professor at the Peetz Research Institute in Oslo, or PRIO. He is also a professor of political science at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and an associate editor of the Journal of Peace Research. Um, so he leads and has directed a number of research projects on security dimensions of climate change and geographic aspects of armed conflict uh, funded by the EU, the World Bank and other funders. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he's also a, a former ERC a consolidator grant holder on the topic of climate change and con conflict. Uh, and uh, I should also introduce, I believe, Chris Mahoney, um, who is lawyer and political, econ political economist. Um, uh, he currently works on the utility of emergent data sources and methods to inform new financing approaches, particularly risk financing. Um, uh, and um, he is working in the finance competitiveness and innovation global uh, practice uh, at the World Bank. Uh, Chris holds a PhD in politics from the University of Oxford. Uh, and um, with this brief introduction, I would just like to tell you that we have about 90 minutes for four papers. And we will set aside about 30 minutes for a QA. and a um, So we have about 12 minutes per presentation and each speaker will there run their own PowerPoint. Um, so with that, let me now give the word to our first speaker. Uh, Nina. The floor is yours, Nina Schlager. Thank you very much for this. I will just try to share my screen as well. Can you all see my screen? Fantastic. So, um, Hi everyone, and thanks for having us today. Um, in the next 12 minutes, I want to present um, evidence-driven models of acute malnutrition and the approach to early warning and also early action developed at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, also on behalf of Professor Dorne and Professor Bavnani. Um, I want to begin with 
a brief overview of um, my talk. First, I present briefly our expertise and approach. Second, I discuss how we arrive at transparent analyses. Third, I want to present to you the SUMT, um, a user-friendly graphical interface that allows end users to interact with the models that we developed and to support evidence-based decision-making. And fourth, um, I want to touch upon our most recent project in mobile phone data collection to illustrate how we develop a holistic approach to forecast child acute malnutrition. Um, I want to begin with our expertise and approach. So um, I cannot see any questions. So in case if you have any questions, just like ask any questions. Um, we began to engage with acute malnutrition in the Merriam project. Merriam stands for Modeling Early Risk Indicators to Anticipate Acute Malnutrition. And this was a four-year project funded by FCDO. And we had different partners at hand, which were the University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins University, and also the University of Minnesota. Um, basically, our task was the development of sophisticated modeling techniques to anticipate child acute malnutrition um, in a field where the state of the art was like kind of low because we began from the assumption that the existing early warning approaches relied mainly on um, expert-based forecasts and they were lacking transparency and formalization. And based on that, we like conducted a preliminary analysis and we found that like basically like one third of predictions deviated on average. Um, take it from there, since no model gets everything right, um, our aim was to provide a whole toolkit of different forecasts and using different strategies as well. So the main strength of the Marion project was really to complement different quantitative modeling approaches and for different questions and also purposes. And you can see that here, that is illustrated here. Um, so different Marion partners have um, developed different quantitative methodologies. And um, this graphic illustrates it quite nicely how different models can answer different questions. Um, the scope of our computational model is very narrow with the analysis restricted to a single subnational region within one country. So we analyzed four overall, but within one single country. And um, so the main sources of data were disaggregated and at like high month, at high um, geographical and also temporal resolution. Um, basically we use like longitudinal tracking data. Um, our approach and our main task was to unpack the complexity of household behavior um, using evidence-driven computational models. Our key questions included, is the same 20% of a population recurrently affected or is there substantial flux observed? Do the risk factors for those affected remain the same over time or do these factors change over time? And um, does a given risk factor have the same effect on all households within a geographical context or does the nature of that risk vary? So it's really like digging down at this aggregate spatial units to unpack like household behavior, differences in household behavior. In our approach, you can see it here. This is the development scheme of our evidence-based models. So the first four steps are basically an iterative process um, because large parts of our work included that going back and forth between theory and quantitative and also qualitative validation and ground truthing, that's what we call it. Um, in fact, validation is key here by design since we look at disaggregate units and we validated in sample and also out of sample and against observed data. So um, there are two parts to the validation that are featured in step three and four. So first in step three, um, there's the quantitative goodness of fit. So that means how well does the model capture real world dynamics? And second in step four, the mechanism validation, um, which is the qualitative validity of the model and the mechanisms that we also validated using field work, like in my first day of work on the project, we went on a two week field trip to Kenya and Uganda, that was nice. <laughs> and um, so, and only in steps five and six, we then use the model to vary key parameters and explore also different policy options. Um, exactly, so on the, these last two steps, I want to present to you in the following, in the next sections, because these are the kind of transparent analysis outputs that we can produce with the model, which are basically two. Um, so we first have leading edge predictions. So 
leading edge predictions are true out of sample forecasts. So the key here is really how well does the model predict into the future. So we made these predictions beyond the end of the available data, or alternatively, you could also say we use all the data we have for predictions. And we estimated the model on that kind of subset. And then um, we forecast acute malnutrition rates um, in a like plus two or plus four month window prediction horizon, depending on the horizon that we wanted. And um, after two or four months, we then recorded the forecast error, re-estimated the model and made a new forecast for each time horizon and so forth. And you can see the um, graphic on the right side that illustrates the leading edge predictions we did for like a pilot engage engagement with FuseNet um, for the context of West Pokot in Kenya. So they can see observed malnutrition rates and the predicted ones by our IDM. Um, so there is one inherent limitation to that method, um, which is that these predictions are based on historical trends. So what, that, uh, what does that mean? All types of models, including our EDM also, um, are trained on data from the past. And thus they are limited in predicting unforeseen events um, that have never happened before. So for example, COVID-19 and others. And we've been confronted with the question of the prediction of black swans or outlier events many times um, during our work on these. So, um, and this is where the next type of output of our model comes in handy, which is the scenario-based forecast. Because to account for this limitation that, um, that um, we use historical data to predict, um, we can also use scenario-based forecast. So for this type of forecast, everything I said earlier remains true. Um, the scenarios are also leading edge predictions. However, we can predict several alternative futures um, based on combinations of different risk factors that like then seem to be important. So the first step to this is to identify key risk factors. In our case, we did identify climate and COVID and basically COVID through economic shocks and then thought, sat together with experts from FuseNet and also from different organizations and thought um, how they would influence acute malnutrition like specifying the mechanisms basically. And um, after we had these like mechanisms, we specified different assumptions alongside to it and um, re-ran the predictions. And what you can see here on the right side is an example output of this. Um, in the next section, I want to illustrate how those types of outputs and analyses can be made available for evidence-based decision support using the simulating acute malnutrition toolkit that also constituted large parts of our work. So what is that? The SUMT, we call it, is an interactive tool that is online available. And the main purpose of it is to like disseminate our work among government, decision makers, experts, nutrition specialists, and everyone else interested in either acute malnutrition, a specific country context, or also um, different modeling techniques. Um, I have a brief video and hope it works like this. Yes. So as you can see here, um, the sum features all modeling outputs from the Merriam Consortium um, for several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and allows everyone interested to interact with them. So we have a documentation included and also a step-by-step -step guide where we like feature different use cases and the tool is available to everyone who wants to reach out. On the left side, you can first choose a country. And then by clicking on the country, you have all the forecasts made available um, in the toolkit. We have everything well documented where you can see which kind of prediction that you're basically using, if you're using statistical or computational models, and where you can also like have different links to like further information on the models. And on the left side, you can then specify in the next step, you can specify different parameters. Um, for example, we included conflict, vegetation, precipitation, and temperature. And you can see how, like by specifying these parameters, the forecast change. And then you can also like dig deep into like different units of analysis. Um, for everyone who's interested in that, we can like discuss this later and I can also send you the link. But for now, I would like to proceed um, with the main limitation that we realized specifying all these models. 
because we realized really quickly that the quality of the model results and the model outputs depend heavily on the quality of the data as well. So that means um, we've been working in four regions and um, we realized that there's on the one hand, either data without a model analysis or there are sophisticated models that cannot be analyzed because there's not sufficient data. And bridging this gap, um, we are currently working on a different method that is like on a different little project that is tasked with um, providing low cost mobile based data collection um, using mobile phones. And just to like present this to you briefly, um, we are currently piloting an open source mobile phone application, the D2A app, that's how we call it. Um, we pilot this in 40 households in four localities in Kenya over four months. And our key questions concern questionnaire design and where we should distribute these to like households directly or to community health workers. And also if the quality of the data collected then fits the standards of the quality collected by, let's say, NDMA or other like data collection mechanisms. Um, ideally, this data would be added into the sum and then analyzed on a monthly basis using our EDM, of course. And like this, we could um, close the arc from data collection to timely or early warning. This is basically it from our end. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to take a lot of them in the Q&A. Thanks so much, Nina. Um, I think you were perfectly in time. And next, I would like to give the word to uh, Chris Mahoney. Chris, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be amongst uh, uh, distinguished colleagues here. Um, so uh, just a quick disclaimer, um, I'm presenting in my, in my personal capacity at the, at the meeting, um, the, the views or the content uh, are shared at, at this point don't reflect uh, those of the, of, of the World Bank. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to just uh, quickly go through a piece of work that we've been doing in, in Eastern DRC, uh, which is um, can can everyone see the screen? It's, it's coming through great. So um, we're looking at three uh, Eastern uh, Eastern Congo provinces, and uh, that's Aturi province, uh, North Kivu and, and South Kivu. You'll all be uh, very familiar with the, uh, the intractable nature of, of, of conflict in the region. Um, and so uh, the, the concept was uh, to try to draw on uh, some of the methodological approaches that, uh, that we've just been exposed to from, from Nina's great presentation uh, so that uh, we're able to better uh, um, uh, vet some of the assumptions that underpin some of the conceptualizations of what are the phenomena, uh, at least most associated with, uh, with change in, in levels of violence, um, uh, so that we might uh, conduct further research, uh, testing different legs to try to understand at least the, then the sequential relationship between different phenomena so that we can start to try to identify uh, some causal pathways, because uh, as we all know, they're um, uh, particularly in large organizations, but even in, in, in academia, arguably, um, there are some uh, levels of confirmation bias where uh, um, actors in their different disciplines tend to tend to uh, test disproportionately um, uh, data representing phenomena that uh, um, uh, that resides in their discipline. And so um, uh, our approach uh, was to attempt to, uh, to, uh, to, to draw on uh, phenomena uh, from uh, across the built, the social and the, uh, um, and the natural world, uh, and to uh, draw on language data uh, that may, uh, that, 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 that may uh, inform perceptions about those things. Of course, 
um, in spite of the significant levels of um, digital inequality and therefore uh, data scarcity in terms of online language data available in a context uh, like the DRC. But of course, we did not just use uh, language data from persons residing uh, in the three provinces. We looked at influential actors uh, from uh, across the Great Lakes and even uh, and even further. Uh, further abroad, uh, and that um, that theoretical uh, basis came from uh, from this uh, from this paper where we used language from only thirty um, uh, influential actors in Kenya. Uh, we engaged with uh, historians, political uh, scientists, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, security studies experts, and psychologists to identify uh, um, and economists. I should have said, and to identify. Uh, who are the most uh, influential actors, irrespective of whether they use online language to uh, wield agency or influence. Um, and so we could get uh, some kind of sense or um, what you might call signal, I guess, uh, to see uh, what their uh, inclination was in terms of being uh, in favor or, or against violence and under the the thesis that we were, of course, testing, which was that that may then uh, uh, signal the behavior of different social groups, right? So whether they were using um, uh, Twitter uh, language, for example, uh, to, to, to mobilize people towards or away from violence or not, or whether they were doing this behind closed doors as members of the security apparatus or, uh, or as politicians or uh, influential uh, business actors or religious leaders or other, um, or other uh, influentially as uh, socially influential actors. So the concept was, let us take that, that piece of work uh, forward uh, and let us also uh, develop a model that ingests uh, not just Twitter language data, but across different social media um, and across different um, uh, uh, online news uh, in, in French and English uh, in this case, and, um, and also attempt to account for uh, what uh, the literature or the body of knowledge on this particular territory suggests uh, um, the phenomena most associated with, with change in levels of violence. Um, and, uh, and here you have uh, the, the, the conflict drivers as asserted by the, um, by, by the literature. Um, uh, and, and we engaged a, uh, uh, an, an actor to, to identify to identify those and develop this model. Uh, and then we, uh, we, we attempted to uh, obtain uh, data representing a range of different uh, climate factors, other con contextual factors. We were forecasting um, arc-led data, as, as, as you all know, uh, probably better than myself. There are, you know, there's a whole emerging body of literature, you know, around some of the, um, the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the um, representativeness of that data. Um, of course, in the in North and South Kivu, we have the Kivu crisis tracker, uh, but this is um, the temporal uh, velocity is not, uh, is, is not great with regards to that data and, and despite the fact that uh, they have a methodological process where they go out and ground truth and check on the extent to which different violence events actually occur. So um, here we, uh, we, we were looking at a number of different uh, economic phenomena uh, alongside um, uh, natural world phenomena. Uh, also there was some uh, built world phenomena in terms of um, uh, um, uh, transportation infrastructure, um, of course, online language about different uh, about different topics, um, and then um, and then I'll quickly run you through the the results. I'm looking at time there. So here you have um, uh, a, a basic matrix identifying uh, some of the phenomena that were uh, that were found, and I should say these results are preliminary uh, to be most associated with enhanced uh, model performance. Um, you can see uh, change in the uh, and, and levels of sentiment about different topics. Um, uh, the, the language sentiment was um, not observed to be uh, of, of such utility other than sentiment about, uh, about concepts of justice, which is in itself uh, is obviously a concept that has uh, high levels of uh, interpretive elasticity. And then, uh, and then you, you, you can see uh, the, the performance of the model here, uh, like our colleague Nina, um, uh, we were uh, we were going. Um, uh, it, it was looking uh, okay, and then of course uh, COVID came along, and we ex we we observed um, significant levels of anomalous data across uh, across almost all the the variables ingested um, in, into the model. And so 
uh, future approaches will be ingesting um, data representing change in, um, in, in the global pandemic, which of, of course itself is, is, uh, is limiting because of the, the historicity of, that, um, of the data that's available. Um, the, the performance of the, of, of the model, we, we looked at uh, three different uh, classes. So uh, a significant increase, uh, broadly a similar level of, of, of violence or, or a significant decrease. Um, and then again, there are some uh, idiosyncrasies uh, that many of you will be familiar with in, uh, in, in, the, in the Kivus where there um, are phenomena that are commonly cited to be highly associated with change in levels of violence, but um, are op op opaque or, or function in the informal market. Um, so, uh, so financial flows, uh, um, uh, material um, um, uh, armed uh, force capacity uh, are very difficult to, uh, um, to, to quantify and, uh, and obtain data representing. So those phenomena are excluded from, from the model and we hypothesize that that may explain the lower levels of performance, particularly in North Kivu, where, um, uh, where extractives uh, are, are commonly cited as, as playing a much larger role um, comparative to, say, for example, in, um, in a Turi where, uh, where the conflict is, is more uh, ethnicized um, and, and where uh, extractives are not um, theorized, at least, to play uh, the, the, same, the, the same level of role. So the, the phenomena that we found to be uh, most associated with, um, with, with change um, uh, and I should just say that um, the it, it tended the model tended to improve in terms of performance uh, over over longer look ahead periods, right? And so this could be explained, of course, by either event counts that fluctuate less with a wider look ahead window, uh, which may make it easier for the algorithm to learn and more accurately predict, um, or some of the factors that drive unrest may take time to affect. Uh, the event counts, and we didn't have time to test with, with different with different lags. Although we will be looking to do that in the future, um, and uh, the model's predictive performance is similar when predicting battles or violence. As you all know, there are these different uh, categories of violence events that that ArcLay produce, um, and while using historical ArcLay data alone yields a mediocre performance, um, significant improvements are seen after adding macroeconomic and, and subsequently uh, social perception features. So adding climate predictions that are generated from our submodel does not improve the performance when the model predicts violent, uh, violent events in all three regions combined. Um, however, when predicting each region individually, adding the climate prediction score seems to improve the performance for Atori and South Kivu, um, but appears to actually hurt the performance for North Kivu. Um, and of course, uh, that, that's to some extent in line with that hypothesis explaining uh, uh, variance in performance across the, uh, across the provinces overall. So this suggests that predicting violence in North Kivu may require unique input data, uh, in particular those pertaining to how climate finds its ways to pathways as, 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 well, as, um, uh, as well as data representing uh, um, opaque, uh, opaque phenomena, uh, relevant phenomena. So, um, on the other hand, the results suggest that the price of commodities and uh, and change in the consumer price index have a high um, have a highly positive correlation with the number of violent events, um, while uh, uh, copper exports and official reserves uh, show a negative correlation with the with the number of violent events uh, that that occur. So the correlation between sentiment scores and conflict, as I mentioned, was not robust overall. Yet sentiment about justice shows relatively stronger positive coefficients. And the climate variables are not strongly associated. Uh, as, as I mentioned, no variable had a coefficient of more than 0 0.5. Um, and in addition, the results indicate that the amount of, of official reserves and, and uh, trade amounts of copper correlate with commodity prices uh, as well. Um, similarly, the sentiment score on justice uh, indicates that um, a moderate level of correlation uh, with with prices of commodities. So already there, there are some indicators that uh, that suggest that there may be some sequential relationship between these different phenomena uh, that we should that we should be beginning uh, to to explore. Um, now, just to uh, come back and and, uh, and wrap up, um, is my screen uh, still sharing?
Um, I'm just going to sort of come to the conclusion here. So, um, so of course, the, 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 the concept is that uh, these types of models may be able to inform um, uh, development operations. And, and, and what that may mean is that, of course, there's the design, uh, there's the selection of what uh, development actors do at what scale, over what timeline, with what collaborators, um, in what location, um, and then also how they communicate about what they're doing, right? So the language that they use to communicate across what mediums. Um, uh, and then uh, there's the implementation of those, uh, of, of those development operations. So not just from in terms of avoiding risk, but also uh, in, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of introducing uh, financing iterative capability, right? And there in, uh, in the sphere of risk financing, one can start identifying what are particularly significant levels of violence, for example, may be set different thresholds. And then when those thresholds are breached, uh, that, that may trigger uh, a disbursement of pre-arranged finance uh, to scale up uh, uh, development operations that are most associated with the phenomena that a model identifies as most associated with um, with increased uh, change in, in levels and in levels of violence. Um, I think I've just run out of time, so I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn back to the chair. Thank you. For Thank you so time. much, Chris. Perfectly on time. Um, before we move on to Nina von Oxkull's presentation, I already saw some questions in the chat. I'll be collecting those for the Q&A, um, but we have two presentations to go. Nina, please. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Lisa, and th thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, do you see my screen now? Perfect. Okay, so it's my pleasure to you uh, to present to you today. Yes, um, it's my pleasure to present to you uh, today uh, co-authored work with Marco de Rico at uh, UNH, uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, as well as Agnes Eloy at University of Florence. Uh, it's an, a paper uh, that provides micro-level evidence on the relationship between climate floods and conflict from, from Uganda. And I'm excited to share some of the results with you to give you a background um, on uh, on the contribution of the paper. Um, here you see a map of a co-author paper with Halva Buhag also uh, on this panel. And it's a map that shows you the, the climate vulnerability scores globally. Um, and it shows the overlay um, conflict events from the UCDP. And what it really illustrates is this, this strong correlation between the two. We have vulnerability in areas that are highly affected by armed conflict so first of all, conflict is a clear driver of this vulnerability, but also when we consider the, the literature overall on the relationship between climate, climate change, climate variability and armed conflict, it's, it's quite evident that we have far stronger evidence for the effects of climate variability and, and drought and, and, and floods on conflict dynamics, on situations of ongoing conflict. So for these two, region, two reasons, um, regions with ongoing armed conflicts, are particularly important, and we zoom in on Uganda, on Karamoja here, which is, uh, which is as you see on the map, in, in, in one of the areas where we have all of these vulnerability factors overlapping. So um, we have this clear correlation. We have a number of correlational studies now on, on the relationship between climate variability and armed conflict, but what is still lacking and what this paper is, tries to, to address is Looking more at the micro level, um, Chris Mahoney's presentation is one example for, for doing that more, like understanding under what conditions and who specifically may take up arms in a situation where, where a climate shock hits an, an area. So we ask um, the broader question in fragile and conflict affected context here in this specific case in the Karamoja regions, how do climate related natural hazards shape armed conflict risk? Briefly about the region. So Karamoja is a region where 61% of the population lives in absolute poverty. It is semi-arid lands. It has a number of um, 
climate sensitive livelihoods. So the dominant livelihoods are pastoralists and agropastoralists as well as, as farmers. So highly sensitive to, uh, to the climate. And it has this long history of large scale communal violence as well as high levels of food insecurity as you see illustrated on, on this map where the, the yellow area with the stressed um, food security scores uh, is the area of Karamacha where we conduct this study. So what are the specific pathways or the th specific theoretical um, starting point that we're having? Briefly, we, we line up with the number of studies um, that consider mostly the socioeconomic and the livelihood impacts of climate related shocks and, and consider that climate related shocks such as flood and droughts have uh, impacts on the material status uh, of affected populations, but also partly related, partly not related, also the subjective um, conditions. So how do people see their, their livelihoods? How do, do they see uh, their situation, which then is particularly important when we consider who may, be a, who may be the ones that are supporting violence or that are taking arms uh, up arms. So we consider these two uh, different factors, material deterioration, subjective deterioration, following climate related shocks. And we then uh, theorize that in a context like Karamoja, which is violence prone, which has experienced a lot of violence, this may then translate into a higher support uh, for violence and eventual potentially uh, participation in armed conflict. So how do we do we go about testing this? And here, um, I think this is really a, a, a unique study in the sense that we have panel data and that we have data that allows us to track the responses of um, respondents that have been exposed to a flood from before the flood to after, after the flood in two survey rounds that have been collected in 2016 and 2019 um, in a survey that was collected by the FAO in context of a program that was implemented by the FAO and partners with about 2000 respondents and um, households are followed up um, from before and after, as I said, but most often we also have the same respondent in the same household. In this data, we have data on self-reported flood exposure, and we have also uh, data on a number of material, material and subjective conditions. And in the later survey round, we then added um, the impacts uh, impact on, on conflict or the indicators that allow us to study that specifically. And in order to uh, study these, both these correlations the, and these pathways, we uh, combine different methodological approaches. So we have self-reported flood, uh, flood exposure data that you see mapped uh, in, this, in this map down on, on this slide. And we also uh, do have metrological data that we can use as, as instrumental variable, given that we have self-reported data, of course, there may be um, biases in terms of who reports flood. So we have also, in addition, this instrumental variable, and we use this, um, we use these data together then with these two, two survey rounds to um, track responses and track changes over time and the difference in difference design. And um, we combine this and with, uh, with the causal mediation analysis to see both um, when there is a correlation, what are the factors driving it. And on, uh, further on the slide, you see here an, an image from, from the piloting done in, in 2019 in, in the study where we also collected the conflict related indicators. So what are the results? The first, and I think quite important result is that we for the first time here are able to present um, micro level impacts of flood. And so we have this flood happening in between the survey round. And we do see that both uh, in models that that, uh, that rely on the self-reported data and, and in models that rely on the metrological data, we find it associated with a higher support of the use of violence um, by respondents that, that, that are reported or that are um, by the metrological data captured as being affected by flood. So that is an important result in, in itself. Um, and we then move on to try to disentangle. So how does this impact come about? Is it socioeconomic drivers? Is it more or less subjective drivers? And, and try to disentangle this. 
So first of all, looking into material conditions, we, we consider what are the flood impacts on crops, for example, livestock, food consumption, wealth index, and the use of coping strategies. What we do find is from 2016 into 2019, like for before and after the flood, we, we see that the, the flood, in, flood exposure is associated with a um, higher degree of uh, use of coping strategies. And it's also associated with a loss of uh, livestock, but not so much with the other or not significantly with the other indicators. As indicated, um, we also think, um, given the theories about conflict um, participation, we think particip uh, perceptions are particularly important. And I think that something that also came up in the in the presentation that that Chris gave, that we we need to um, we need to consider not only not only the material conditions, but also what people think about them. So we consider here also the absorptive capacity and transformative capacity, as well as financial and cap uh, capital and socio-political capital. So for example, capturing whether people think they can bounce back for after shock, whether people think they can transform their livelihoods following shocks, as well as whether they can rely on the help of, of government and politicians following, following shocks. And what do we find here? So we do not find uh, support for significant relationship with, um, with absorptive or transformative um, as well as financial capital, but we do find, and that's I think quite an interesting, we do find that people who were flood exposed were significantly less uh, happy with supportive of the, the supportiveness of the government. So, so they have a more negative view of whether they can rely on the support of politicians in times of crisis when they have been exposed to, to this severe flood shocks in, in 2018. Moving on, we then take the indicators that were uh, significantly affected by flood according to our data and see whether they can explain the observed relationship between flood and attitudes to violence. And here I must say the results are more mixed. So we, we do find also in causal mediation analysis, we do find the, the total flood effect showing up um, again and again, but we, we do not find support for these factors, livestock use of coping strategies, as well as political capital as being significant mediators of these relationships. So this means we, we, we still observe this um, significant relationship of flood and attitudes to violence. And we find similar results when we use other related dependent variables, for example, use of um, or stealing when, when going hungry and related questions, but we do, not, we do not find that this pathway analysis gives us um, hints on how does this relationship come about. To conclude, so um, this is a study that for the first time, is able to identify robust effects of, of flood on attitudes to violence in a context that is particularly relevant, being conflict affected, being, being climate vulnerable in many, many ways. And this panel data, the unique panel data with survey, uh, with the survey before and after the flood allowed us to, to track flood impacts on, on livestock, um, use of coping strategies, as well as the supportiveness of the government. That's also an interesting result, but we did not then find that these factors were the ones that explained the overall correlation between floods and attitudes to violence. So beyond these results, I think this, this study makes clear two things. So first of all, I think it's, uh, it's illustrating that data that is collected in monitoring and evaluation um, efforts um, can be used if adapted to, to also track uh, implications of climate change and armed conflict, as well as the role of aid and other factors that are collected in these efforts. So I think this is just underlining the, the opportunity that there is with the data collection that is done in many projects. But it also underlines, and here I think this is a connection between the presentations we have heard before, and it also underlines the, the importance of data, the importance of uh, frequent data uh, collection that allows us to nuance these results, to track pathways. Uh, as I said, we had one limitation was that we had, didn't have all the indicators on conflict in both survey rounds. So really, 
data collection, frequent data collection is something that is so important to allow, to allow us to, to study these relationships and to track impacts of climate shocks as well as interventions addressing them. With that, I, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions by email now in the Q&A and I also want to acknowledge that the data was collected by FAO in these projects together with partners such as the UNICEF and the World Food Program, as well as FAO colleagues who worked on the metrological data for this project. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Nina. Um... So I saw that uh, there are a few questions in the chat, but to the, you in the audience, please feel free to put more questions there. I will collect them later, or then you can interact more directly with the panelists during the Q&A. Um, now we move on to our last presentation. I give the word to Halbert Buhag. Halbert, please. Thanks, Lisa. Um, let's see if we can get a screen up and running. Like that. Right. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, attending this panel. Um, uh, this is a paper project in, in progress. I'd like to start by just acknowledging uh, the contribution of my co-authors, co uh, Sebastian Schutte, Andreas Tollefsen, and Jonas Vespi, um, who are all colleagues at PREO, but not, uh, unfortunately, able to attend this conference today. Um, the point of this uh, the point of departure for this paper is a study that we did last year, where we looked into uh, what are good, robust predictors of asylum migration to Europe. And we thought, having done that study, that um, could we perhaps use the same analytical approach to also try to identify good predictors of internal displacement, uh, displacement within countries. And so we uh, did a survey of available data uh, we also uh, did some surveys of avail available literature. Uh, we put together a, um, a better data set and did some initial tests, some descriptive statistics, but also some initial uh, predictive uh, tests. And we quickly realized that, uh, no, we cannot do the same, uh, cannot use the same approach to, to arrive at good predictors of internal displacement. And there are many reasons for that, including uh, fairly varied patterns across disaster categories or displacement categories. Uh, also in terms of theoretical expectations, it wasn't clear to us that we should expect one universal predictive effect of a, a given uh, variable across uh, uh, different uh, types of drivers. Uh, so we decided that we cannot uh, do this. Let's, let's aim for a slightly less ambitious approach and focus on one particular type of a driver, and in this case, we have selected floods, similar to the uh, previous paper, but where displacement then is the outcome and not um, uh, support for use of violence. Um, uh, here's a graph that shows the evolution in flood disasters as registered by MDAT over the past half century. Um, many of you will be familiar with this general trend uh, because the trend in uh, floods at the global scale uh, mirrors very much the overall trend in so-called natural disasters, uh, which has increased steadily throughout the period, uh, but especially up until around 2000, early 2000s, and since then, uh, for various reasons, uh, the number of disasters have, have more or less leveled out with significant variation, obviously, between years, but uh, uh, we do not necessarily see the same continued growth in the last few years. Um, if we average over the uh, first and the last decade of this period, uh, we will see that there are, in fact, um, uh, a substantial increase, a, an, an increase of uh, a factor of six uh, in terms of global frequency of flood events between the first and the last decade of this particular uh, sample period. If we look at the consequences of these floods in terms of uh, uh, reported number of lives lost, the trend is quite different. Um, um, averaging the first and the final decade again, we will see that there's been a decline of almost 90% in the average uh, number of uh, reported deaths per flood event. And if we look at the global total numbers, uh, again, as we saw at the previous, on the previous slide, there's been a, a considerable increase in the number of floods, but even so, 
the total number of reported casualties from these floods uh, have declined uh, by one third at the global level um, throughout this period. Uh, so evidently floods are becoming less destructive and less damaging uh, if we are using uh, lives lost as the sole criterion for, for severity here. This again is a trend that I think is fairly well documented also in, in reports elsewhere. So we were not really surprised by this. Uh, and I think it's uh, one, one very uh, prominent explanation for this decline in uh, mortality uh, uh, from flooding is obviously that societies have uh, become more uh, resilient. They are less vulnerable to uh, flood exposure. One possible other uh, uh, or related explanation that we also consider then is, could it be that um, a displacement in some sense uh, functions as a uh, substitute for fatalities in that today uh, people may have better options and better opportunities for moving uh, when the flood is coming, perhaps there are better uh, early warning systems that allow people to evacuate ahead of time, for example. And so that is basically our uh, next point of departure for this paper is then to, to look into the displacement patterns related to these flood events. Uh, here we're using a different data source. We're using uh, data from the Dartmouth uh, Flood Observatory because they have displacement figures uh, for individual flood events. Uh, the MDOT database uh, does not have that. Uh, and so the temporal domain of this particular database is, is more restricted. Uh, it only goes back to 1985. But even throughout this period of the last 40 years or so, uh, we see a considerable decline in the average number of people being displaced by flooding. And so our initial uh, and arguably a naive working hypothesis that uh, fewer people are dying from flooding because more people are uh, being evacuated and are being uh, able to move ahead of time does not appear to uh, hold water. Uh, and so we're left with, with a little bit of a puzzle, maybe. Um, what explains increasing flood frequency? We're not going to say much about that. It's basically uh, beyond the scope of this paper, but uh, there are length, there are, there are uh, broad literatures, I think, on, on various explanations, including obviously climate change contributing to a wilder and wetter weather. Uh, population growth obviously uh, increases exposure in many areas to flooding. And obviously also better reporting could uh, feed into the uh, increasing trend in, in reported uh, flood events or flood disasters that we have seen. When it comes to declining flood mortality or the impact of flood, as mentioned, uh, a reduced vulnerability over time, uh, I think is an important uh, contributing explanatory factor. Um, it could also be that better reporting is in fact uh, meaning that the uh, flood registries that we have have a much larger share of minor floods today, whereas uh, the records for flooding in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s maybe uh, were dominated more by the ma major floods. Uh, but looking at these average statistics really mask a great deal of variation. So uh, 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 there's large variation around these average mortality or average displacement figures per flood event. And so in this paper, what we are primarily interested in looking at is what explains or what predicts the variation in displacement levels, having controlled for uh, the number of people being exposed to a given flood event. Uh, that is a knowledge gap in the literature that we are trying to uh, contribute to filling. Uh, and this, just to uh, forewarn you a little bit about our conclusions or our preliminary conclusions, uh, giving a solid and, and robust answer to this question turned out to be actually quite uh, tricky. Uh, the data that we will, will be using uh, are based on the Global Flood Database, the GFD, uh, which provide georeferenced data on the areas of all, uh, not all, but of areas of flood events recorded in the Dartmouth Flood Observatory catalog, catalog since 2000. Importantly, uh, the GFD database only includes a subset only about 30% of the floods registered in DFO since 2000 are covered by the GFD. So that is a major concern. Uh, and the reason for the limited coverage of the georeference data is 
that these data are based on remote sensing. And if the weather is clouded, it's hard to determine where the flooded area is. Uh, in some areas, complex topography also uh, made it hard. And of course, also some floods may be relatively small and therefore not uh, um, picked up by the remote sensing technology. Uh, the outcome variable is then the number of displacements uh, reported per flood event. In terms of predictors, what could uh, uh, explain more or less uh, displacements per flood event? We are looking at four different categories, building a little bit on the logic of the earlier asylum paper that I mentioned. First of all, we're looking into a limited set, uh, and this we're going to uh, look further into um, as the paper evol evolves further, a limited set of flood characteristics. We're looking into some socioeconomic contexts, uh, some political contexts, and finally some security contexts. And to be more specific, uh, we include both flood level uh, predictors and country level predictors. Uh, at the flood level, uh, looking at flood characteristics, we are counting the number of people exposed to flooding. And so here we are using uh, high resolution population rasters, overlaying them with the high resolution uh, flooded area rasters, and thereby counting how many people live in the areas that were flooded, judging from remote sensing data. We are also looking into the duration of floods in days, uh, since earlier literature suggests that that is uh, a significant driver of uh, various forms of impact from flooding. And then at the country level, we are uh, counting the number of floods occurred in the country of the last 10 years, since that could give some indication uh, about experience with flood exposure, which again might have some influence on uh, both the states, but also uh, individuals and households' ability to a plan ahead and to actually cope with flooding without necessarily having to evacuate. Uh, as socioeconomic indicators, we are presently using uh, nighttime uh, uh, light data uh, to indicate areas with higher or lower levels of economic activity. And we're looking into uh, GDP per capita as an average country level indicator of economic level of development. Uh, political context is represented by a measure of the share of the affected or the exposed population that belongs to ethnic minorities that are excluded from uh, national power. And here the logic is that uh, people who are discriminated against and excluded are less likely to be uh, supported and evacuated by, by the state. And therefore, plausibly, uh, we might expect to find higher displacement levels in those areas. At the country level, we are using a liberal democracy index as a proxy. And then finally, the security context is really limited to considering consequences of armed conflict. We have counted the number of battle reported uh, or battle related uh, that's in the flooded areas of the previous six months before the flooded uh, flooding occurred. Uh, and then for the country level indicator, we are uh, including a measure of the number of reported battle deaths of the last 10 years. Uh, so the unit of analysis here is then the individual flood event in the country, um, the outcome variable, uh, which is a number of reported displacements, uh, has a, a quite distinct uh, distribution, actually, it's zero inflated, uh, 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 around a fourth or a quarter of all flooded events have zero reported displacements, but at the same time, it's also over dispersed. we have a, uh, a few observations with very high numbers of displacements reported. And so to try to capture this uh, quite distinct uh, distribution, we are using a Bayesian regression models. We are using two linked functions. I will only focus on the hurdle, hurdle ne negative binomial uh, link function in this uh, presentation because that is the one that performs the best. Um, we are using, uh, we are splitting the sample in two. So we are using most of the data for in-sample estimation and also for in-sample prediction. And then we are reserving the last few years for out of sample prediction. And this is also an approach that we might uh, revise and we, as we move along and, and uh, uh, adopt different ways of, of doing uh, out of sample cross validation. In terms of specifying the different models, uh, we are using eight uh, competing models, if you like. Uh, the, uh, the baseline model contains only the flood specific indicators, and then the most complex model contains all of the predictors that we uh, just went through. Um, just to give you some idea of, of what the data looks like in terms of predictive uh, uh, effect, these are average uh, effects or average predictions 
of how the number of displacements will change as we increase or decrease uh, the value of any given variable of interest, holding all other variables at their mean levels. And so focusing on the left plot, which uh, is a count of the number of people living in the flooded areas, unsurprisingly, as the number of people affected increases, so too does the uh, number of people predicted to be displaced by, um, by flooding. And this uh, effect is statistically very significant. Uh, and so therefore we might be uh, having high confidence in that particular prediction. Higher duration also is associated with higher predicted levels of displacement. Uh, and also the larger the number of previous flooding events in the country, the higher the level of uh, displacements predicted by any given flood holding all other conditions at their mean levels. Uh, when it comes to the economic context, we find that higher levels of GDP on the right-hand side, GDP per capita, is associated with lower levels of displacement, all else equal. So that suggests that higher or more developed countries are more resilient and better able to manage floods uh, without having high levels of uh, human displacement. So that's uh, a good thing about development, I suppose. On the right, on the left-hand side, sorry. Uh, we see that uh, at the local level, uh, uh, the predicted number of displaced actually increases with, an, uh, with the amount of, of uh, luminosity in the area. Uh, this probably reflects, again, also the number of people living in the area, even if we are controlling for that, those uh, controls may be uh, uh, inaccurately estimated. So this effect probably also picks up a little bit of the uh, exposure uh, uh, effect. We find basically no effect for our simple political variables, uh, whether the flooded, uh, whether the flood affects a politically included or excluded population does not seem to affect our prediction. Um, uh, there is a tendency uh, that the model predicts higher levels of displacement in more democratic societies. But this effect is uh, uh, non-significant and the difference in the absolute uh, numbers of predicted displacements is quite small between an authoritarian and a democratic regime, all else equal. And finally, the security context also does not seem to matter. Uh, and this was perhaps not so surprising. Uh, uh, focusing on the left-hand side, the number of people uh, being killed in the same areas the flood occurred in the previous six months, probably people in that area who were uh, 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 particularly vulnerable would already have left by the time that the flood occurred. So that could be one reason why we see less of an effect, effect here. Um, so those plots that we have just seen uh, visualize the average uh, uh, prediction effects uh, from the model. Uh, here we focus on the full distribution. So we, we, we run the prediction simulations many times. And so we arrive at spread in the predictions. And so the gray areas show the full distribution of predictions. And the upper boundary of these predictions uh, are probably more informative in the sense that they could provide more information on uh, uh, the worst case outcome of uh, any given uh, disaster for the given uh, variable uh, values that we uh, uh, have in the model. What is interesting also here is that the blue line that you will see is completely horizontal on all plots. That is the median predicted effect. And the median of all these models for all variable uh, values is zero, meaning that uh, uh, the model basically, uh, if it has to give one prediction for any given random uh, flood, it would predict a zero displacements as the median prediction. That says something about the <laughs> uh, lack of uh, high quality performance of these prediction models. Uh, and probably this model is, is less uh, performing less well than some of the earlier uh, food security prediction models that we have seen at this uh, panel. Uh, we also looked into the uh, different models, how they compare together. Uh, the uh, model that contains the flood specific information plus the economic variables turned out to be best both in sample and out of sample. Um, but the, especially out of sample, the variation in performance between the different prediction models is small. So basically we predict almost as well with only focusing on the number of people exposed to a flood and uh, the duration of the flood as we do when we add information on uh, the political context and the security context and the socioeconomic context in the area. 
so that's again a little bit of a disappointment and uh, well but that's where we stand at the moment uh, so what does all of this mean um, well, first of all, uh, the in-sample average effects are mostly as we would expect and mostly in line with earlier literature to the extent that earlier literature discusses uh, uh, prediction of displacement specifically. Uh, but we also find that our models are really bad at predicting accurate levels of displacements uh, when we run the model on new data. Um, there are various reasons for why we uh, do not uh, obtain better results. Uh, one obvious substantive reason, I think, is a causal complexity um, that we are unable to fully capture in these models. Uh, so that's something we are going to look more into. Uh, mobility is almost always multi-causal, and that also applies to most of the flood-related displacements. Uh, if you have a well-functioning uh, government, for example, that provides evacuation uh, opportunities for you, you're more likely to actually uh, leave than if you are left to yourself. There are also could some you please wrap up in one minute? Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll really wrap up. There are also some data issues that really, really is concerning here. And I'll show you some examples of why we think that the data that we are operating with uh, is uh, suboptimal. Here we have on the left plotted uh, the number of reported displacements against the number of reported deaths. And you will see, you will see that uh, there are a number of uh, flooded events that have a zero reported displacement, but a high level of reported casualties. We do not believe in the zero displacement for those events. So that's something we will have to uh, figure out how to deal with. And on the right-hand side, we also find that we have these disasters or floods with either very high levels of population exposed, but no displacements. But we also have a number of floods where, according to our data, uh, there were virtually zero people exposed, but at the same time, very high levels of displacements. Again. Uh, this suggests that there are some issues with the data that we need to uh, uh, deal with. So just to conclude in 10 seconds, uh, there is some issues with how data, how displacement, sorry, is defined, and that has some implications also for the quality of reporting and the quality of uh, managing the data by the uh, data providers. Um, uh, tentative insights so far, economic development seems to matter. Uh, not so much the political and security context. Uh, however, we need to look more into the data and to figure out how to deal with and minimize challenges by the poor data. And that could also substantively affect our conclusions. Sorry for giving a bit of time, but um, thank you for the attention. Thanks so much, Halvard. And uh, thanks so much to the panelists for a set of really important and inspiring papers. Um, there are three questions in the chat and um, to you in the audience, if you would like to ask a question, please just let me know in the chat. <clears throat> I start with a question by Hector Morales Munoz to Chris, excuse me. <clears throat> the question is, do you relate or validate the language factor, which you present as an exacerbating factor against existing dialogue spaces like governance structures to resolve grievances such as land tenure or unequal food system structures? Perhaps just, just a two minute response and then we um, continue with two questions for Nina. Um, so amongst the, uh, amongst the topics that we collect uh, our language about, uh, first, you, you know, asserting that these represent grievances um, is, uh, is, is possibly a step too far. Remember, uh, the, the, the approach collects language um, from uh, online, use from uh, publicly uh, available from, from public Facebook pages, from, uh, on, uh, from uh, Twitter, from uh, YouTube comments. So of course, first there's, uh, there's uh, the digital inequality issue. So what percentage of the population uh, have um, uh, internet access, uh, uh, one, then on social media, it's what people are saying, right? So then uh, the, uh, in, online news, it's what people are reading. So it's the information they're receiving, right? So there's, uh, there's, there's all sorts of uh, representation or representativeness uh, issues in terms of the extent to which this language really uh, uh, reflects uh, broader, uh, broader grievances, particularly from the most, uh, uh, those most vulnerable and marginalized communities that, uh, that even, are even more excluded from, uh, um, uh, from these platforms. Uh, then there's what topics. So yes, 
we, uh, we, we look at the relationship between, uh, say, uh, just, uh, the, the concept of justice and other topics, right? And what we did find was that uh, it's actually, there's actually a, an elevated level of, uh, of, of negative sentiment um, about justice when it is associated with uh, individual uh, political actors or political parties, right? So what that tells you is that it goes to the agency, uh, the agency of individuals or entities that are perceived to have agency uh, drives the greatest level of, of grievance, uh, given the caveat of everything I just said about representativeness, as opposed to grievance about specifically land itself or uh, food or uh, the price of petrol or, um, uh, or, or other or other substantive issues. Um, yeah, the, the grievance really is about those perceived, those actors or entities perceived to have some level of agency over these sort of areas of societal contestation, whether that's public services, land and resources, uh, access to political participation or, uh, or justice and security itself. Thanks, Chris. Um, I continue with a question to Nina from Nancy Boyer. Do you use these models to redesign or recommend interventions to alleviate malnutrition and or violence? Um, if so, what were the interventions and what were their impacts and who were their funders? Um, perhaps you could limit your response to one to two minutes as well. And then there's another question for you. So I'm not sure if that goes to Nina or me, but I'm maybe also to, to, to the other Nina, but I will, I will answer briefly. Um, so the data that we used uh, was collected in for evaluating the joint resilience strategy uh, of several partners in the area, and there are general, uh, generally um, many interventions in the area, but it wasn't, um, or well, we didn't specifically use it um, to evaluate the, uh, the impact of the of the program. What we found, and that, of course, it was important to to control for to control for and to to address in in looking into the impact of uh, of the flood, whether whether the interventions hadn't had. Um, we I mean, know how the impact the interventions were distributed in the area. We found that the flood affected areas got less um, less aid overall. When we look into the the funds dispersed to um, dis dispersed to households, but this wasn't in in the uh, the focus of this specific study, um, given the given the the lack of over overlap between the areas that got, got the specific program where where the the um, data was was collected, so there wasn't really the specific um, focus in this study, but it wasn't a an opportunity that opened up itself because of the data collection in in the whole of Kermaja. Thanks. Thanks. One more for you, Nina von Oxkirk, uh, from uh, Michael Schroll from the UN. It's not clear what the mediating factors are from floods to attitude to violence. Um, I feel the context such as socio-political factors, historical competition for resources, general long-standing grievances by communities are very critical, but don't seem to feature strongly in your analysis. I tend to look at events such as floods as triggers or catalytic rather than uh, our relative cause. That's a great question. So we chose to focus on Karamoja because of because of the presence of many of these factors in in the area overall. So there are these scope conditions that are um, present in the area, such as many of them. Um, what you mentioned here, we didn't do it on the disaggregate or at the household level, but generally, um, as I indicated in my presentation, uh, there is there is widespread grievances, there is widespread uh, poverty, and and many of the factors that that we tend to think are general scope conditions for these factors uh, to occur. So further studies could look more into the household level at the uh, or into household level variation in that sense of would be who would be the one uh, among the ones that are um, that were flood affected uh, who are supportive of violence. But we were mostly interested in to see to see whether um, if we experience a flood, which are the, the mechanisms um, that are, or which socioeconomic and, and subjective effects does the flood have? And can we explain the, the, the flood effect that we have observed in this data by looking more into these indicators? So, thanks. I think Chris Mahoney has a two finger on that point. Um, yes, uh, we, we have a, a, a... Uh, the, the World Bank has a project in uh, um, in 
in, in Uganda uh, called uh, Dr. Dip, the Development Response to Displacement Impact Project. And so, I mean, Karamoja doesn't, uh, uh, refugees are not settled there, but um, but one of the things we observed that, 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 that I find really fascinating about uh, Nina's, uh, Nina's work is, uh, is the potential for uh, um, deforestation as a, as a phenomena to potentially um, and enhance that work. So Uganda over the last decades is one of the most deforested uh, territories in the, in, in, in the world. It's also experiencing this displacement shop. Again, that's not, that's not Kar Karamoja, but this is bringing into tension in the West Nile part of the country. We're already seeing uh, this play out and in increased levels of violence between refugee and host and host communities in spite of the, um, in, in spite of the very inclusive uh, approach to um, to refugees that that Uganda has it, it hosts the third highest number of refugees in the world the highest number in Africa um, over in over in Karamoja um, you have the Northern Uganda Social Action uh, Fund which is uh, I believe the largest uh, um, that the largest sort of uh, project that responds to these droughts so it's looking at the change in in the um, uh, the, the change in the color of the ground change in uh, deforestation I mean all all your you know, you're in, in DVI, all that that goes into um, all, all that FuseNet data and, 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 and all of that, that basically triggers disbursements to scale up uh, support to the most vulnerable households. So I, I wonder if there's, if there's scope there, um, uh, there, there's scope to explore um, further enhancement of, 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 Nina, of Nina's work and we'll follow up there. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Nina Schlage, there is a question for you um, by Halva Buhog. Could you say a bit more about what were the most influential predictors of hunger in your model? Uh, yes, sure. So um, we've been in the beginning. I know that we've been also like looking into like more aggregate level predictors, just uh, like night time lights or something like that. And we also ran into the same problems that uh, Chris also talked about with the actual conflict data. And we used different like conflict data set for that. But uh, for us, I don't know how suitable that is for your model because you're looking at more like aggregate kind of indicators, but for the household level indicators that we found to be influential because this is mainly what we included. We just had like three shocks, which is economic shocks and um, conflict shocks and climate shocks. We had these run like in the background, but we've been looking at like household level indicators and what we found is the household water source like used to be very an important predictor and um, the household gender and education. That's what we found basically. And we have been also looking into illness, but that wasn't as important, I guess. So, but for, if you are looking into more aggregate um, indicators, you could look into water sources, I guess, that could be like an interesting indicator because there's also different ways to measure it. We've had like data from household surveys, repeated household surveys, but there's also like different um, options for that, I guess. Thanks, Nina. There are two more questions for Halvard. Uh, one from Pevi Luyala. Uh, does your displacement variable capture short-term displacement, um, like evacuation, or longer-term displacement? Uh, that is, those who do not return right after the flood uh, is over and to perhaps even left after the flood event. Many of your hypotheses could change depending on which one of the two you try to explain or predict. Perhaps you could answer that first, and then we have a second question for you. Yeah, uh, no, that's a very good uh, question by Pavey. Uh, and the answer is that uh, it varies, right? By, by country, it probably also varies over time. To what extent really short-term uh, uh, displacement will be counted or not. It also varies to what extent, I mean, uh, and this goes back to what I uh, ran out of time, so I didn't have much time to discuss, but what really is displacement, right? How long do you have to move in order to be counted as a displaced person? Is it sufficient to move to the next farm that is slightly uh, higher up in the ground? Or do you have to move to the nearest city, et cetera, et cetera? And so in the absence of a universally agreed upon uh, uh, and respected definition of what is a displacement, uh, different providers of statistics will, uh, will, will provide different information. And of course, media reporting also varies in terms of quality, in terms of comprehensiveness over time. And so the data that we use, which are uh, supposed to be the best in the business, uh, really have some limitations when it comes to this. And the, the honest answer is that we cannot necessarily tell for each individual case what were the precise definition that were applied 
uh, in terms of how long would they have to be displaced before they were counted? How long did they have to move before they were counted? Uh, so that's something we have to work with and try to minimize uh, through validation of our data. Uh, but the simple answer is that this varies across uh, event or across events. And the second question from Omair Farukhan uh, from Pakistan. Uh, casualties owing to floods have been declined in developed states. A reason might be um, because of low population density. But in countries like Pakistan and India, flood-induced deaths and displacements have been witnessed in the last couple of years. Perhaps you could comment briefly on that. And then um, we have a couple of minutes for Camille Marquette's question. No, I think that is also a well-placed comment in the sense that there is a, a considerable variation across space. And that's also one of the initial motivations for this paper to try to tease out the variation that we observe between events, also in terms of uh, consequences of flooding. But I do not think it's uh, so simple as a question of rich versus poor states, developed versus developing states. Bangladesh, for example, which my, by many standards is still considered a, a low-income country, has been heralded for their ability to minimize human cost of flooding. And so they have seen an increase in extreme precipitation events, increase in cyclones, and an increase in overall flooding. Uh, but they do not have the same amount of casualties as, as they had some decades ago. Uh, I cannot tell specifically about displacement figures for Bangladesh, but in general, um, Bangladesh is seen as one of those ca uh, cases that have uh, really been able to improve their resilience to flooding. And then there's one final thing, if I uh, can sp uh, spend 30 seconds on that, and that is that casualties is something that is obviously bad, right? If, if a flood leads to uh, uh, that, you know, it's a bad flood. When it comes to displacement, that is ne not necessarily always a bad thing. The alternative to, to, to leaving, to escaping, might be that you are uh, submerged, right? And so trying again to deal and navigate in this area uh, when, when the displacement may both be an, unwant an unwanted thing, but also indication of uh, high early warning capacity and high coping capacity, that is tricky. Thanks. Um, Camille's question gives me the opportunity to give each speaker a minute to comment. She um, asks, hi, I would like to have feedback from all speakers on how their tools or research has been used by local stakeholders like governments, communities or NGOs, as opposed as by international IGOs and INGOs. So um, I suggest we do this in the order of presentation. We start with uh, Nina Schlager. I think that's a fantastic question, especially since our models really pertain to like these kind of disaggregated household levels, since we've been like not analyzing like country level variables. So um, we've been like, we developed these models, like that was the scope of the like project that we've been working on about the Merriam project. And then we've been also discussing with local partners at the local government level with the National Drought Management Authority of Kenya Perhaps you're familiar with them. We've been discussing with this kind of authority where we could like follow up with them on the institutionalization of the data and outputs we produce, right? Because they have this kind of drought early warning bulletin that's like a monthly um, newsletter that they like that they um, produce, and we like looked into ways where we can like. Um, institutionalized the Merriam output and the Merriam forecast because for now they haven't been forecasting anything but we've been looking at ways to like situate that and that model forecast into that newsletter for the local government in West Cocot. Maybe that answers your question. Chris? You're still muted. Um, yeah, uh, just just quickly uh, in terms of the uh, the design of, uh, of a portfolio of, of development engagement, in terms of uh, the design of individual uh, project based uh, lending, um, the intent is that these kind of models can identify uh, um, not just uh, what to do, what scale, where, but also which stakeholders to engage with. Right. So if we're able to, to identify those uh, stakeholders whose uh, language, for example, is most associated with decline and violence, um, uh, then uh, we, we, we can target those, those, those actors for engagement, right? Uh, and, uh, and either um, 
and operationally or also um, you, you know, for, for, for co-communication potentially. This is something that's under exploration um, and, uh, and, and it also enables uh, what we call informed community-driven development. So that's, uh, or, or more informed community-driven development so that if we have a model that we're able to provide that kind of ob objective data, this is, these are the configuration of real and perceived phenomena most associated with change in levels of violence. We can uh, historically and contemporaneously, we can provide that to, to those communities so they can say, okay, if, if that's what this means, this is the way we understand it. And therefore uh, these are the, um, the, the sub-projects or the kinds of projects that we would like um, disbursements to finance, right? Nina, for looks good. Yes, uh, thank you. I think that's a great question. So generally, um, I know that the FAO, which which is co-authoring co co this paper, um, is uh, working with the Ugandan government in in the uh, both in in terms of implementing implementing projects in the area, but also um, the, the the survey has been designed uh, together uh, with stakeholders, such as kind of providing the indicators on 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 subjective resilience. So this is one one way of linking up with with uh, local stakeholders. And then, of course, the academic output that is that is coming out of this will be uh, published uh, open access. Um, so this will be another way of, of making results of this uh, accessible to everyone. Then, um, as this is my final word, I want to want to take the opportunity to both thank the um, the conference organizers for for putting this together and for for Lisa for chairing and for all the speakers um, to participating in this. Given that I have been um, putting this together, I want to take that opportunity as well. And and with that, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Nina Halvard. Yeah, uh, let me just first echo Nina's last words. Um, then second. Um, uh, there actually are already quite well functioning and, and frequently used models of uh, prediction models of flood exposure or flood events. Uh, and so uh, that's the first step. What we are trying to do is to model the second step, which is given flood exposure, uh, uh, how can we predict or can we predict uh, uh, likely levels of displacement? And based on our current results, I think we are some uh, distance away from uh, having a uh, a tool that is useful for uh, local stakeholders or uh, international stakeholders. Uh, but obviously, um, our ultimate goal is to have some influence also out there in the real world and not just on the computer. And so at some point when our, our data is be are better and our model is better, uh, then hopefully we could connect the uh, flood exposure or flood prediction models with the consequence model that we are operating with here. Thank you so much to the panelists and to the organizers. Um, I also thank the audience for your attendance today. I hereby close this session and would like to remind you that you're warmly welcome to join us for our upcoming plenary, um, the Environmental Peace Building Awards and Dialogue, um, which is going to start at uh, 3 p.m. CET today. And we look forward to celebrating our growing academic community with you. So with that, I wish you all a nice rest of the day. Bye.